You've spoken a lot about, you know, the whole concept of the setup, which basically, you know, as Ramchal says, that a person consists of two elements, two different components. One is physical, the other is spiritual, and um, obviously that's a tremendous conflict. Each one, it's like a tug of war. Each one is trying to pull, obviously, toward its, itself. I also talked about what the eight Sahara is, uh, you know, last week, what the eight of is, and that's obviously all part of the battle, uh, and, and so on, you know, which obviously influence, or at least they try to influence. It's like a tug of war, where you are thrust in the middle of the eight Sahara and the eight Tov, and I spoke about that, what that is, and I introduced the whole concept of ego, necessity, and so on. That's really part of what you want. So clearly it's a tug of war. Uh, the question then is, of course, is, okay, how long does this happen? How long does this ensue? This tug of war, you know, and so on. So what Ramchal now is going to talk about is the concept of the time period. There's a time period for this struggle. That's really what it is. It's called the Avoida. It is a struggle to overcome the obstacles and to do the Avoida, to do that task or objective, <coughs> obviously, that the Belgium wants. So uh, we have that concept, <coughs> the concept of a time period, of the struggle itself. And then we have the concept of the time period, of uh, the, uh, the reward, because that's really what it is. <coughs> obviously, as I once mentioned, you know, the Belgium, what he could have done is just created Oilem uh, Habo, left it that way, and then you would wind up in Oyelim Habo immediately. There would be no concept of avoid or struggle at all. But as we had mentioned before, you know, previous Shurim, there's a whole concept of Nahamnik Sufa, that a person has to earn what he gets. That's obviously a very critical component of his ability to actually um, experience Oyelim Habo. And that's really what it is. If it wasn't for the fact that if you get something free, and if you experience this tremendous shame, embarrassment, which is called Nam Lik Sufa, uh, this feeling of that what you're getting now, you haven't earned at all, uh, and that's a detriment, that's very difficult to obviously to be soiva, then obviously you wouldn't need it, the whole Oilam Haza, you wouldn't need this world at all. You just straight to Oilam Haba. I'm sure that many people probably say to themselves, hey, you know, well, give me the option, you know? I don't mind living to turn at least I get something, you know, like this is no risk. Because obviously there's a tremendous risk if you don't make it, you know. But uh, yeah, whatever. The, the Nishamas that have not been born yet, they experience Namli Kisufa? Uh, yeah, 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 they have Namli Kisufa, exactly. So the whole point really of creating this world is what is called a Tikkun of Namli Kisufa, to rectify the problem that a person will have in Oyelim Habo if he receives tremendous amount of Kainuk, Hano, uh, whatever that is, uh, he will experience Nam Sufa. So therefore, the version what he decided is to split the two, two times. There has to be a time period of Avoida, where you actually work to achieve the task, and there's a time period of reward. And therefore, that necessitates two time periods. It also necessitates two places. There has to be Noidim Habo, which is the reward, and Noidim Haze, which is the place of work. Why does it necessitate places? Uh, well, because in order for the struggle to be successful or to be possible, it's a better word, you know, there has to be an enormous amount of hester. So, so and then, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. And the, the concept of Oilam Hazer is really where it's not clear the direction that you should take, that there is an Oilam Habo in that sense. It's not clear, you see. In other words, if the Russian decided that you need to choose Bechira, free will, then obviously he can't make it obvious to you that what you can do in doing, if you do an Avera, it's wrong. If it's that obvious to you, you can't sin. So the whole thing makes no sense. That's why Malachim, you know, they don't get Oilam Habo, they don't have Oilam Haze. To a Malach, he's created a certain position, and that's the way he remains for the rest of eternity. So there's no struggle by a Malach. 
Because the Malach sees what? He sees everything clearly. There is no ignorance. There's no cloudiness or murkiness at all. There's no Hester. There's no concealment whatsoever. So, you know, even if he had free will, he had no options. Or he has, even if he had the free will, and even if he had the options, he would never sin. He would no, never go contrary to the will of God. Well, how can you, you know? If you're looking at a cliff, you know, if you're looking at a cliff and you know that if you take a step and you're over the cliff to certain death, would anybody do that? No. Unless he will obviously be incredibly depressed or deranged or whatever. So therefore, a malach cannot in any way really sin because the, the options of sinning is, uh, is negative. You know, it's not, uh, it doesn't make sense. So by places where he means environments. Yeah, yeah, but I mean my environments, that's right. Yes. And, the, yeah, and therefore, the environment of the struggle is called essentially Ulam Habo, excuse me, Ulam Hazeh, this world. That is the environment basically of the Avoidah. And the environment for the reward is, course, of course, Ulam Habo. So, a per- person, the degree is the outside of the rebellion from himself because he has this whole structure that he's put inside. He's greater than a malach because a malach can't. Well, the way can, he, yeah, or it can't expand. Can we can't become an, a person is the greatest degree that it, there is if he. Yes, if man. He uses, man is the greatest or the pinnacle of creation. Why? Because even though we are now lower than malachim, right now, because we don't have his intellect, we don't have their intellect, we don't have their experiences, we don't have their insights or their their perceptions and so on. However. <clears throat> The potential of man is much greater than Allah. It was we can easily, or not easily, I should say, we can achieve something which Allah could never achieve, and therefore, qualitatively and quantitatively, we could be. It's hard to say, you know, the measure because we don't even know Allah, Mom. But it's almost like you can become infinitely greater than Allah. So, what, what, if a guy was listening to this class, if a guy was what? If a guy was listening to this class, yeah. Where would he? It wouldn't he like, and he would hear like the truth that's being expounded. Here. What about? Well, he says, "Okay, well, you know, I'll never get. I, I can't be like a Jew. Stop. Why? Why let him convert? Sure. He, he that, let, let him that observe. Option. Let him observe the Shem and Mitzvahs. Because the guy who observes the Shem and Mitzvahs uh, gets on the On a certain level. Yeah, on a certain level. Yeah. yeah. If he'd want to get more, he'd have to convert. Yes. And then he could even become from the greatest of the greatest. Oh yeah, sure. They're, what about the uh, um, Shmai Vavtalia, if I remember correctly? They were Gerim, which means that they converted. So any niv, any human Nivra has that, there is a choice. There's somewhere available to him to be able to get to Correct. the ultimate yeah. ticket. Yes. Basically, I mean, sometimes a person comes back as a Gilgal where he has no choice. Because this Gilgal is meant for suffering. So in a certain sense, well he has choices. <clears throat> But not that type of a choice, you know. But everybody does always have a choice. There is always an option. Unless you come back, you know, completely retarded or, I mean, you know, the people never who are just, you know, but they're you, out of it. We don't have a choice of Furious Rowell, uh, the path of a Kohen. No. So that's fixed, you know, or a lady or something. No, no, no. We don't have a choice which position we're in, but we certainly have a choice, our level of achievement. You know, I mean, yeah, you're just like, you know, you don't have a choice to be, uh, you know, uh, if you're in Israel, to be a lady, no. But it doesn't make a difference. If you accomplish your task the way you have to, you'd be far greater than a lady. So you don't have a choice in terms of your starting point, your position, you know, but you have a choice in terms of how much you can achieve. And in Eilim Habo, that's what makes all the difference, you know. It's the Mahamashat HaMachachim, Kohen Gadol HaMaris. Yeah, Kohen Gadol HaMachachim is great. Sure. Yeah, clearly. Does this mean by definition that the, the, the worse a person has it, the bigger the sign is, the bigger difficulties, the bigger the sorrows a person has, the better for him? Because the, the more tester and the more problem, the better off he is now. Well, you see, when you say better, better is a, not an easy term to understand. Because what happens, what happens if he has that? To be masakin things, to rectify things. Oh, he does. So he's got to undo a lot of damage he did. So does he become better? 
Not if it's, in other words, if he has to undo, remember, there's two things going, going, always going on. There's the, un, you have to undo the damage that you've done to our virus. So that will give you a whole set of nisirs. And then there's the stuff that you have to do to grow in Ruchmias, which means to increase enormously your level of Kiddusha. There's always these two things going on. So you may see somebody, you know, has a tremendous uh, difficulty and so on, he's or whatever, and let's assume he overcomes it. But is that because he's undoing Chatoim that he did, either in this Gilgul reincarnation or in some reincarnation? You know what I'm saying? So therefore, what he's, he's basically undoing Kilkulam, right? Or is, he's, or is this a concept of Kiddusha, where he's, uh, you know, getting, gathering tremendous amounts of Ali, Ali and so on. So, you know, which is it? Is that sense? Could be a little of both. No, it's always both. It's always both. Always both. Always both. Let, let's say someone like you would imagine, like uh, it says the Gemara, like Rabbi Lazar ben Pedas. We don't think of him as someone that, that was a Gilgal. Rabbi Lazar ben Pedas was a tremendous Ani. Yeah. Gemara discusses. Well, that that's different. That that because because there's you know the first Gilgal that a person comes, I should say Gilgal, the first entry into Ilm Hazer does not depend on acts that you've done because you've never done any acts. You know what I'm saying? What it depends on is called muscle. And nobody really knows that. You know, when the, when the Neshama comes out for the first time and all of a sudden it finds itself in a <coughs> tremendous poor situation, you know, that doesn't mean that that person sinned and therefore he's being punished by being poor. No. What it could mean is that this is his muscle the Russian wants him in this situation because in that situation he has to do what an Oni will do. You know, in, in terms of that he won't complain that he's poor, he won't be Mahari after the meetings of the Rabbanu Shalom, question the attributes of God. You know what I'm saying? Now, why is he an Oni? You know, he could say, hey, I'm, you know, guys, I'm an Oni, why is he the rich guy? You know, I'd much rather have his position than mine. You know? But that's uh, the first time that the Shama comes down. It's unknown. We don't know why the Muslim picks. I and mean, it's based on you know, different things. We're in the, we're in the, in the con- configuration of the Nisham of Odom Rishon. He's located and so on, you know. But uh, those, those things are beyond, uh, what do you call it, uh, conceptualization. We don't know why. Why he, this is the entry. However, once a person has lived one lifetime, then he has accumulated either an enormous amount of mitzvahs or avarice or both. So that already will shape the next Gilgo, you see. So, uh, that, you know, so we don't always know. Although today, basically, there are no, basically, there are no new neshamas anymore. Very f- infrequently, there's a new neshama that was never here before come down. Today, we're all recycled. If you want to use that expression. <laughs> you know, we're all recycled uh, neshamas, you know. We've been here, and who knows how many times we've been here. We could be here a thousand times. Oh, yeah. Times. We could be born every other year. Yeah, that would be there to die every year. <laughs> miles. miles. What? I heard there was a storm. I'll tell you one thing. If you could cash in that frequent five miles, you'd be the richest man in the world. I heard there was a storm to go home. Oh, there, there is a storm. Uh, if, if you have not done a thing in three Gilgulim, you don't come back. Right. Yeah. But that's if you've done nothing. But as long as you've done something... <laughs> positive? What? Huh? Positive. Uh, some positive, yeah. You know? Then uh, then you, you come back. Once. What? You know, he said all main ones. You yeah. come back. You come back. You know, you come back to try again and so on. And, and, uh, look, you should know in the end, even though Gilgul sounds pretty bad, it is an unbelievable chesed. Because it allows you to repeat performance. It's, uh, it's what's called a makeup test. You know, it allows you to undo all the damage you've done and allows you to keep acquiring. I mean, it's a whole territory, it's like Gilgal. <coughs> yeah, we wrote all about the, there are many swarm written on Gilgal. And you the Ramchal, the Ramchal held of it very strongly. Gilgal? Yeah. Sure. Well, that's, that's basic Kabbalah, you know. I mean, the, what do you, you know, the Ramban talks about that, uh, about Gilgal and so on, you know. Uh, you find the concept of Gilgal in other religions, you know, it's not just Judaism. That has a concept of reincarnation, you know, or to whatever transmigration of souls. But uh, Gilgal is a tremendous chesed. It allows us to keep coming back. The going were also Gilgal. What? The going were also Gilgal. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you see that uh, what the, the Zoya says side? that the enemies of Israel will come back, you know, finish the job, you know. It's like Haman, and I believe Hitler it was a Gilgal of Haman. And his ten guys, all the ministers, they were all his uh, kids. You know, there are Gilgulim, you know, and so on, you know. I believe uh, Saddam Hussein was a Gilgul of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, it's interesting, that's my belief. Um, I won't tell you what I believe Clinton is, but anyway. <laughs> Which is very interesting. Turn off the tape. Maybe we should turn it off first. Yeah. Yeah. Can't stop I, I want to hear, hear Obama. Oh, Obama. <laughs> should we turn it off? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I don't want to get a call from the FBI and say, excuse me, you know, who's, who's Obama? <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Uh, whatever, but the, the, a lot of these people are Gilgulim, and then they come back to, you know, especially what well, the Zoya says, the evil people come back to finish their job, and then they're destroyed, I mean, in that sense, you know. Because once a person does evil, then he, they, they will send them back to finish the evil, perpetuate it, and then they're they don't have anyone here? No, they really don't. Oh, well, <coughs> that's, that's like a good question. That he got, he got that's it. <coughs> well, he was taken away after five times. Right. And then so same thing, like, up. okay, you just... Too bad. Yeah, you made your bed, and now it's, you, know, you have no Bechir anymore. But anyway, so the main idea here that Ramchal is saying is that, you know, because of the necessity to be Oivei, to work, to struggle, uh, because of that condition, there needs to be two different places, environments, and therefore two different times. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, what, what's important to understand, I once gave a sheer... Time. You stay over time. Say all the time. Yeah. I feel realized, but you know, the, the, the chesed that the Mansham has done is beyond belief. You know, if you add up all the chasodim, I'm not talking about the day to day, but the chasodim in the setup itself is beyond belief. You know, and uh, you know, um, uh, just uh, just a couple of the chasodim. You know. I mean, normally, what does a guy do? You know, normally a guy, imagine you, you, you work as a, a clerk in a company, right? You're a clerk, you know? Low, low position. You know, bank teller, let's say, right? Then at the end of a week or two weeks by, whatever it is, they pay you a check, right? So normally you get, what do you ever get? What do you get? Two, three hundred dollars a week, whatever, you know, and so on, right? Imagine you're a low, low, you're a clerk in a company, you know? And you go over to the teller and you say, you know, the person says, okay, uh, and they're giving out checks. And they give you, you know, uh, one hundred million dollars. So you look at the the person give a hundred million dollars, you know. He says, "Excuse me, what is this? Some kind of joke?" He says, "No, that's what you earned, you know." So what would you say? This is unbelievable, you know. I just did a week's two weeks worth of clerkship. That's it, you know. You need a hundred million dollars. You know what I'm saying? Or would be beyond belief, because the the value exchange. It's completely inappropriate, you know? So you think this way, you know? We live, right? Let's say, hopefully you live 70 years, whatever, 80 years, 90 years, whatever it is, right? And what do we do? So we do some mitzvahs. Okay, there's a struggle. But when you compare it to the hanor, the reward quality and quantity of what you get in all your book, you know, it's beyond belief. Doesn't make sense, you know. Okay, you know, it's like the Vilna Gaon before he died. So they say, you know, they picked up his tzitzis. He said, to him, How hard was it to wear tzitzis? You know, you don't even know you're wearing tzitzis. It's a beggar, there's tzitzis, and that's it. But for every second that you could take it off and put it on, whatever, you get a scha, a reward that we cannot comprehend. For what? You know? <coughs> so that's the beauty of life. As long as you're alive and you do a mitzvah, you know, yeah, how, how difficult is it? The reward level of that mitzvah is beyond all comprehension. What a chesed that you do zero. It's, it's, you know, if you take a look at the ratio of these struggle to the reward, it's laughable. It's a joke. So where's the, that is an unbelievable chesed. So where's the, That's one. What? Where's the ticket of Dhanav Yisufa if it's so in, inappropriate? It, no, because Bershom doesn't care. No, because in the end you are a cause. You did something. Yeah. yeah you know, what he decides to give, it's his business. You, did uh, you know? Look, yeah, but you, you caused <coughs> that situation, you get it. 
So that's the first unbelievable chesed. The, the ratio between the struggle and the reward is beyond, beyond comprehension. The second chesed is that, okay, okay it's $100 million, but eventually you spend it. Even if it's $100 million, right? Eventually you're going to spend it. You know, given, a, given enough years, you will spend $100 million. It'll take a long time. But given enough years, you will spend that. Okay? But wait a minute. This is $100 million, right? Is it total? It never ends. Right? It never ends. Oilam Habo is ne, you know, is Netzach Netzach. You know, can you imagine something that goes on for a billion years? Who can imagine a billion years? <coughs> you know? We, we, we barely can understand 70 years of our lifetime. Imagine what a billion years is. You know, scientists say that the universe is, three point, uh, is 13.7 billion years. That's how long the universe is. Okay, forget about what we would know. We obviously don't believe that. But what's 13 billion years? It's like we, you can't even think of 13 billion years. And 13 billion years is a zero compared to eternity. Because it never ends, you know. <coughs> imagine you start Oyle Mahabo and a billion years have passed, you know. And you say, wow, such a long time. What a long time. It's like this is zero compared to the rest of the time, which is it. It goes on forever. So not only is the reward level beyond comprehension, the reward time is beyond comprehension, you know. It's funny. It's like no matter where you are in Oyle Mahabo at what period of time, there's always the eternity after you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, I used a, you know, I used a billion years. Well, the whole thing's gonna last me another two billion years. No, there's an, from that point, there's another eternity in front of you. That's what it means to be eternal. Never ends. It's beyond belief. You know, you just think you can think about that for a, a, for hours. What the concept of eternity is? You know. So that's a second unbelievable chesed. Think about that. Not only is it a hundred million dollars every nanosecond, the amount of pleasure is right. Is like you know, I mean, it's not. It's a hundred million dollars <coughs> every nanosecond. You're getting a hundred million dollars. You know, but it goes on forever. Beyond, it's like the press. And what do you do for this? You know, you, just, uh, you know, you put on tzitzis, put on film. I mean, come on, you observe Shabbos. You know, I mean, you know, what is this? So that's a second incredible chesed that the Bonshev did. The third chesed that he did, you know, is that even though you want to be the ticker of Nam Sufa, right? And that's why you have to struggle. What happens if you fail? <clears throat> what happens if you fail? So Gilgo, which is a makeup test, or the ability to undo and earn more is a third unbelievable chesed. The Russian doesn't have to do this. You know, here's what you did. You got your score and it's the end of it. You're either you're in or you're out. And if you're in, you're only in at a certain level. And that's the end of it. No. The motion will allow you to repeat this again and again and again. As long as you're in it, you're in it. Now, chesed that is? Think about that. That's a third incredible chesed. And then the fourth incredible chesed. What happens if you don't do mitzvahs? You know what I'm saying? So Bershim says, okay, I'll give you two more ways to do the tikkun. Which is what? Chuvin Yisur. So the Bershim provides you with many ways to do the, to do the uh, tikkun, the job. So that itself is an unbelievable chesed. You know what I'm saying? And that you have more than one path. Gehenim is the Yisurim factor? Yes, well, Gehenim is a tremendous chesed. Right, so I'm saying it's the Yisurim. Oh, well, yeah. So that itself is incredible. They have more than one way to do the Tikkun. Let's see. Well, so, somebody who has Yisurim without knowing what he's going through, he's also, he's also doing Tikkun. Yeah, of course. He is experiencing Yisurim. I mean, he's not doing Tshuva because of the Yisurim or nothing. He's just experiencing pain in Pain in and of itself is Mechapeh. Whether he knows why, <clears throat> or he's angry at the fact that he's in pain, you know, it, 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 that's elementary fairness. You know what I'm saying? How can you have pain and then make it conditional? Well, does he know what it's about? <clears throat> does he accept it? No. He's under enormous amount of pain. 
You know? So the fact that we have two other ways besides mitzvahs, there's tshuva to undo, and the yisurin to machaper, is an unbelievable chesed, you know, and so on. So the, 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 the multifaceted paths is an unbelievable chesed, you know. Could you comment on this? I'm not sure if I, it was a long time ago I read it, where the Baal Shem Tov said he had a dream or a vision where Nishamas were going up and down, and at the slightest remorse, Hashem just waved away the, the consequences. If the Nishama showed the slightest remorse to Hashem for anything wrong, he was clean the slate. Did you ever hear anything like that? No, no, no because that's, it's not that simple. Okay. You know, Chuv has a process. There's a process, right? There's a vidui. I'm trying to check my options, but... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. But the only religion that allows that. <laughs> yeah. There's a check. It's not just a check. It's also a check before. No, no, no. It's like the only religion that allows an instant tshuva right, is Christianity. You know, do you accept them as your savior, whatever? And why? Because they don't believe in avoid. It's all grace. That the Bonish says, look, you Jews, you guys can't do it anyway. Right? So therefore, it's all grace. They, 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 one of the fu- fundamental tenets of Christianity, other than the Trinity and other stuff, is, is the concept of grace, which means that you have to do anything. By his, by his death on the cross, you are absolved, and you will get the future world. So therefore, it was somebody once wrote, once wrote an article many years ago, it's, it's astounding. Imagine a guy, a Nazi, right? he killed, you know, 100,000 Jews, you know, and that's what that was going on, right? And right before his deathbed, he had, you know, he had, he felt bad, so he calls the priest to give him what's uh, whatever. Last rights. Yeah, less rights. Yeah, it's less. It's really about less wrongs, but that's beside the <laughs> uh, So he gives him less rights, and, and all of a sudden, that's it. he's forgiven. What do you mean? You just killed a hundred thousand people? How can you forgive him? That's their concept because they have a concept of grace, which of course does not exist in Judaism. Actually, yeah. Well, so gr- actually, grace does exist in Judaism, which is all these chesets. That's the grace. But to say that a guy does not do a thing, there's no such thing in Judaism. You know, and that a guy can have a kapora just by saying, you know, uh, I believe in him, for, and he died on the cross and all that kind of stuff, right? Come on, this, this is a, so therefore he's instantly white, whitewashed and all that. Anyway, uh, so look at the chasadim. You know what I'm saying? The amount of, you know, the the uh, the time to work is a lifetime. The amount of time of reward is infinite, is eternal. The amount is a joke, and the amount of reward is incredible. Then you have the assistance of Gilgal. Then you have the assistance of three pets, you know. And then there's the assistance of Gehenna, believe it or not. Gehenna is a tremendous chesed, you know, because what happens if a person has done so many averis that Russian will not give me Yisun here because it would kill him. So Gehenna is a place where Yisun won't kill you. You see, because you don't have a body. So it's very hard to die without a body. You know what I'm saying? So Gehenna is a place that a person can suffer, not die, and still exist. So, you know, or else he couldn't forget <coughs> him. There's no way to give this guy any kapara. So um, Gehenna is a, kap- is a kapara. Is a tremendous act of chesed. In, in a nutshell, Gehenna is a place where you can, where you need so much yisurim that you cannot survive. You, survive, you must. Yeah, the rule, the, the yeah, the the uh, rules of life, living cannot be served that Gehenna. You just because we'll we just collapse oh. now. Then, you know? uh, but in any case, so Gehenna is a chesed. So you know, you think about it, all the incredible chasadim and so on. You know, and then in the act itself, you know. Um, <clears throat> Uh, even even in the in, in terms of mm-hmm. uh, um, if a person uh, if a, even even tshuva is a tremendous chesed. I guess besides the fact that it's it's a path and so on, but the fact that a guy can undo whatever he did is a tremendous chesed and so on. So therefore, what what we see here is that the whole thing is not balanced here. It's not a balance here and so on, and the, the whole the whole concept of what the Bosham <clears throat> demands uh, is all completely disproportionate to what you have to do here, you know. <coughs> uh, so therefore, a person really has to be thankful, you know. But you know what the biggest chesed of all is? That you exist. You are, you know. And uh, it's a lot better alternative than not being. 
you know. Let me ask yourself. The greatest gift the Brother ever gave you is you are a real being that is aware, awake, conscious, you know, and so on. So for and not only for a person who's a you know uh, the fact that you exist, one that you you don't exist as an inorganic, inanimate object. The fact, right? Although sometimes you look at people, they they really look pretty inanimate. But anyway, uh, you're not inanimate, you know. Not only that, you're not an animal, which is animate. And not only that, you have consciousness. You're human, and you have consciousness, and you're a Jew. And not only a Jew, you're Ben Torah. I mean, that's like the that that's like the top. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> As I say, you know, Shaloi, that he didn't put me by Yeshua Kronos and so on. You know, that's a tremendous uh, chesed and so on. But in any case, these are all unbelievable lefnim shuls at the end. You may think about that. You know, uh, but I want to tell you something. You know, tzaddikim don't buy this stuff. Tzaddik, why? Because it diminishes nam sufa. I should say it adds to nam sufa. The only thing that doesn't, you know, is <clears throat> what a tzaddik wants is it says that the Muslim is medagdik with a tzaddik kechuta sayro. Means if you did a wrong, you will get punished exactly what a is. It's the full measure of the din. Full measure. Why? Because if the Rebbe in any way softens the din, right, then automatically there will be Nam Sufa. And a tzaddik doesn't want that. A tzaddik wants immediate and full retribution. And therefore when the tzaddik dies, whatever he has is totally up in din. Whereas everybody else can't survive that way. The concept of Rachmanus is the greatest, one of the greatest chassadim. With the Bansham, what, what's the definition of Rachmanus? What is the definition of Rachmanus? Mercy or compassion or Rachmanus? Who knows? Not going to call it Which means, okay, yeah, okay. It's a suspension of judgment or justice. That's what Rachmanus is. But that itself is an incredible chesed. So chesed in Din is called Rachmanus. That's what it's called. And when Zulman Shem is about chesed, in the din itself, that's called rachman. So wait, is it that Hashem leaves, leaves a person with him for Olam Haba? He leaves a person, let's say he was not a Tzadik Gamor, but he, he's in Olam Haba now. He, he remains with a certain a degree of Nama de Kisuf for eternity? Or is it that Hashem works it, that whatever amount the exists or not exists, Kafia, however much, now he has to get rid of the Nama de Kisuf completely, so... There's only that that whatever is 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 zayche, yeah exists that, as a that, lesser creature whatever that, it is. Truth is that's a very good question. What are the like we 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 are dependent so much on Rahmanus that he doesn't you know. Don't you have the visions of the people without an arm or with or, or with a dirty clothing or yeah. whatever it is. So. But the, uh, that's how you know. So we need we need that. But then the, the the question you raise is very significant. You know. So what does that mean? That means I will have more Nahamdik sufa. Because it's not dina, because I saw the Bosham has waived the strict judgment, you know. But the fact that he's waived is no more din justice, you know. So therefore, the guy's gonna have more nam sufa. So that's a good question. Can, but can a person? Our whole point of coming down here is to remove the nam sufa. No, I'm saying is Hashem, quote unquote, okay with okay at least let's say. Let's just say 50%, you got rid of your nominee kasufa, the rest is, you just didn't earn it? Or is that Hashem says, so oh, what I, I need perfect nominee, I need no nominee at all, therefore you only exist 50%. What, so my answer would be, you need to remove everything. Because Oilam Hapo cannot be nominee kasufa. Can't be. Why? You know, because that would interrupt or disturb. It has to be perfect. Pleasure, it has to be per- right? So the question is, okay, now what do we do? What happened? And the answer is, who? Gilgul. The Bunshin will pay you I'm back. at the end of the line. Oh, at the end, we're all clean. So, we're all, that's what it means, Yalbino. We're all white. So right? Hashem, yeah, it's well, Kishelek. Hashem Remember Hashem the the it says, wait, wait, wait. Remember it says, you know, Yalbino Kishelek? Right. We're all white. We're white. You know, white, which means every, every single accounting that we have to do, <coughs> sins, anything like that, is white. There's not one fleck. <coughs> that There's not one, you know, fleck. Um, Spot Stings. on the garment, but the question is, how did Bosham do it? And the answer is, it well, he did it, you know, in one lifetime, two lifetimes, three lifetimes. It means 
over the many lifetimes and over the many things, the many journeys that you have to take, you will be clean. So basically, but he won't do it. But it's a tzaddik. It's a tzaddik. It's not that tzaddik will be clean. He doesn't want to even wait. Right. So basically, it's a hundred percent existence with zero non-mikdash. Correct. Yeah. 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 But But you may not have not. But they're different. That's what I'm about to say. Okay. Everybody's hundred percent is different. Yeah. But the, right. you know, it's, the, the whole concept is to be able to create. You know, there's two inyonim. There's to remove all the chatoyim. Then there's to get all the kedusha. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's like there was a person. The morning I think of what deserved Rabbi Elazar to die. What was his name? And he visited every woman of the night, whatever that means, right? He was just into this, you know, big time, you know? And he was, the Gemara says that he was once with a woman, whatever, and, and his, and he wore tzitzis. I mean, what about from a guy, right? And his tzitzis start banging at him like that because of the wind. So this woman said to him, you know, just like the wind will come and never return, you will never get a new harbor. You will never see anything, you know? Well, apparently, what happened was, is that, you know, sometimes somebody says something and it pierces your heart and all of a sudden you understand clearly the significance of that message and he was stunned. So he left and then he put it, he sat between two mountains or whatever and he more says that he <coughs> cried and he died from his grief. So Basco came out and said, Mukhan, enter a Lozaben to die into Ilm Habo. So then Rebbe, Moses says that Rebbe heard that and he started crying. And the famous statement is, Oil Mish He got Ilm Habo one shot because he was an incredible sinner, whatever. And because he had such an unbelievable charata, right, regret and so on. And so that's an unbelievable chuva. So Rebbe, so Rebbe made that statement. There are some people that get oil mabo in one shot. It's incredible. So the, the people ask, well, what did he cry for? <coughs> what did he cry What's he crying about? It's incredible that a guy can get his oil mabo in one instant, you know? And the answer is, you don't want oil mabo that way, right? Why? Because what that did, his chuva removed all his chatoyim, you know? So he got into oil mabo, but there's nothing there. There's no house, there's no, you know, they, they, you know, he didn't do anything. So that's what Rebbe said. Oy vey for those people who get into Oyum Habo in an instant, but that just means that he got in, you know, that they, they did the kapor of their chatoim, of their sins, but they got into Oyum Habo. Yeah, but what kind of Oyum Habo is? He didn't, there's no, he didn't do anything positive. You see what I'm saying? So he has the barest minimum of Oyum Habo. Anyway, so that's an important, but... To answer your question, no. You will be, everybody will be totally clean. And the Baruch Hashem, and that's what he does. The Baruch Hashem is always arranging. It's, like, it's, a, it's, like a, it's, it's called micromanaged. The Baruch Hashem looks at each neshama and he says, okay, the objective is in the end of time, this guy or girl, whatever, has to be clean. And therefore, he is micromanaging your life to get you there. And even if it takes many good gulam, you'll get there, you know. So the chesed is that he's not going to come down, you know, like a thunderbolt and kill you right there and there, you know. That he'll spread it over, if need be, many lifetimes. So, is there a so again, that's an incredible chesed. Is a person who's suffering from something that's not life-threatening. The is what? Something that's not life-threatening. Somebody will say, uh, his skin itches. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's probably a story. Yeah, yeah. So is there a point in putting a cream to make it stop itching? Yes, there's a point. Or I should not because I want to, if it have a serum, I want to get rid of, I want to get rid of, I want to get rid of, I Well, there is an Indian where a person is getting a serum, you know what I'm saying? And, and uh, no, no, <coughs> what I would say is this, that if he can stop the serum, then he should. Why? Because it's making him dysfunctional in doing mitzvahs. You know, you can't do mitzvahs in this kind of a way, you know? Right. It's when a person can't do anything that a person can say, well, you know, I, I want to, I'm a kabbalist, soon be avo. 
you know, uh, that, that uh, in other words, I won't pray that the Moshim should take it away. So, are, so that, you, you, yeah, people will not do that. You know, they will, they will not pray to the Moshim, Refor Einu Hashem V'nei Rofei, send me a refuel or cure. Means, you know what you're doing, but not that they can take it away. You know what I'm saying? We do say that's that, wrong. To me, it, right. it makes no sense. If a guy has a suit that he can remove, right, then he should remove it. You see what I'm saying? Because the revolution gave him the wherewithal to remove. So you see, it's when he can't do that, but he can't pray for the reform, and there are people who do not pray for reform, they say, Roshim, do what you have to do to clean me up. So you assume that our I'm making a, you see the difference I'm making. Even praying is probably a chiyuv, no? It's a No, no. The person doesn't have to say that. So why do we have an affair now? Because we, in, in the end, it, it interferes with our doing mitzvahs in a certain sense. You know? The Baron writes that the reason the Tzfil... The Baron Kotler. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think I'm going to say, the reason the Tzfil is, the Yisurim are the person to connect. So through the connection, they should take away the Yisurim. That's how Tzfil Yeah, well that's, well, that's... If you doubt it, because the, the point of Yisurim, besides it, is to be connected to Ebershtad. So through the Tzfil, it takes it away. You have it through... That means your market, that Ebershtad, the one that does it. So therefore, you don't need the Yisurim anymore. So in that way, you mechal, that's how the tefillah takes away the yisurim. Yeah. How do you should daven to take care of that? That's the way you set up the system. Yeah. But uh, should a person pray that yisurim should be removed? There are people that say no. Don't pray. Yeah. 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 So that they they, they say that, you know, Bosham, you know, do what you have to do. Clean me up. That's you know, it's like a surgery. Yisurim shalav. So there's no mental terror tefillah. Yeah. Doesn't okay. Cause any, uh, yeah. But anyway, so sure? these are all the chasodim. I mean, there are many more, obviously, you know, but uh, what I'm trying to show is that the setup itself is completely disproportionate to what goes on. It's an important idea. That, uh, so in the end, what, what do you see? Is that the worship is on your side. That's what you see. Ultimately, what you see is that the version is in your corner, as they say. Yeah, but he, but he, he's in your corner that he wants you to be in Oyelim Habo and enjoy everything you can get. And he's there for every which way. That's the upshot of all of this. You know? And not only is he in your corner, totally, that he wants you to be in Oyelim Habo getting the best experience you can. But then the experience itself is beyond belief, like I said. You know, so in that sense, um, you know, that's what it means. That's really what it means. Everything that the Bansham does is only the Tav. is only to get you into Ilam Habo for an infinite period of time with the greatest possible Hanor. That's really what it's all about. You know? As Nochamish Gramsci used to say. So, anyway. With children of a certain age, they don't. Um, they don't participate in this exchange of good and bad and uh, teshuva and things like that, right? Yeah. Up until bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah. Uh, you mean because well, the, like they, yeah, there's no there's no culpability yeah, or uh, guilt. Life-threatening diseases, you know. But that's for Gilgul. That's a whole other story. Also, well, that's Gilgul. They didn't do anything. They're not culpable until thirteen. Right. Right. So why would they have to suffer? All that anything below thirteen, <coughs> uh, well, uh, is all guilt. You know, it's all previous lives. Clean up committee, clean up session. It's really what it is. Anyway, so what the Ramchal says is that, like I said, so th- th- that's uh, an understanding of, uh, of the chesed that the Bansham does in terms of getting you into Ilam Haba and so on. You know. But anyway, what we see is that basically there's two time periods and there's two environments or places that the Bansham has to create. One obviously is Ilam Haza. And the other, of course, is Oyel Mahabo. So once you understand that, we can now understand to break down those two essential periods of time. What are the different time periods of Oyel Mahaze and Oyel Mahabo? And that's what I wanted to discuss. What are they, really, you know? And how do we divide them based on what has to happen in those time periods? So the first thing you have to know is that which was created which was created first? 
was Oilam Hazik created and then that becomes Oilam Habo? Or was Oilam Habo created, made Oil into Oilam Hazik, and then we make it back into Oilam Habo? Well, just the way I phrase the question, when the Bunshim created existence or realities, which I think I mentioned before, he created Oilam Habo first. And then he degraded that, Oilam Habo, and that becomes Oilam uh, Hazik. And it is our job, which called Zikuch, which he will talk about later, <coughs> it's our job to reconvert or to retransform Oilem Hazeh into Oilem Habo. So therefore, there are what's called Kufas. There are different time periods. So, if you really think about that, let me go through the time periods of each one having its significance. The first time period, obviously, is the creation of Oilam Hazen, this world. So we can look <coughs> that the first time period really is before the entry of Adam Harishan. When the Nishamas exist, but they have not assumed any physical God. This is called pre entry. That's the first significant time period. It was after you have the whole creation itself, you have the Nishamas waiting to be born. The second time period is Odomarishim, when a Nishama actually joins a goof, so to speak, and becomes a man. And that person now is now in a situation where he has to do whatever his task is, which when, is basically a mitzvah. When were the Nishamas created? Before. Before when? Well, the world was created, if I remember correctly, 974 generations, uh, the Torah was created, yeah. but 974 before the creation itself. So at some point in time, because the Torah is the blueprint, at some point in time, you have the creation of the world, you know, and so on. Um, the creation of the world is six days, right? Yeah, well, I yeah, mean, six days. That's right, yeah. Six so days. the Nishamas were created before the world, before the world started being created? In between the Torah and the world, so that's when the Nishamas were created? Well, yeah, well, the Torah is the first thing, because right. the Torah is the blueprint, the architectural plans. Okay. Okay. And then after that, everything will follow after that. And then you'll have the creation of Malachim, <coughs> depending on which day we're talking about, you know. But the Nishamas are created, uh, probably the first day or whatever, which is the initial time period of the creation itself. Did you define, so they're the first. Did you already define what El Mazay was talking about in the previous year? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, I mean, basically, the definition or the criteria of each ulam, I want to mention there are five ulams. The criteria is to what extent is the presence of the Rabbanu Shalom revealed? Hester. The amount of Hester defines the reality. So, the greatest amount of Giloi, which is the s- s- smallest amount of Hester, obviously is Ulam Habo. The greatest amount of divine revelation clearly is Ilam Habo, and therefore has the least amount of Hester. Although there is Hester even in Ilam Habo, and every 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 second we get more and more presence of presence of the version. That's really what happens in Ilam Habo and so on. <coughs> uh, and then as you go down, Ilam Hazar already is a place that has Hester, where you don't perceive the version. He's much more hidden and so on. And then when you get to this world, which is called the Oilam HaShofel, the lower world, this world, and so on, you have the greatest amount of Heston, which is the greatest amount of concealment of the Bershom's presence. That's what we have. So the amount of Hester, or Ha'ora, is the reverse of Hester, is the criteria or defines the type of reality that you're dealing with. There's only one cre- physical and one spiritual creation, and then... Depending on the time period, you're gonna have in the spiritual, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're talking about the spiritual world or the physical world. We're gonna have a different type of Hester. Well, though they exist now, let me put it this way: there is one thing called Ilam Habo, and then there are four different levels of Ilam Hazer. There was even Ilam Hazer is a Hester place, but that itself has four different levels of reality. Which I once went through, if I'm not correctly, you know. You have Oilam Atsilus, and you have Bria, Yetzirah, and then Asiya. And then Asiya itself, you have different levels within Asiya. There's what's called the seven heavens, 
Shiva Rakiyam and so on and so forth, until you get to the, what's called the Ulama Shofel, which is our universe. It's physical. Ulama Shofel is physical? Yeah. The other Ulamas are all spiritual? They're, yeah, they're spiritual. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's fundamentally the breakdown of reality and so on. And uh, so therefore you have the time period where the Nishamas exist, but they haven't entered any goof. The second time period is when they have entered uh, a body, and that's Adam Rishi. So that was uh, all of a couple of hours, that was, that's all it was, until he did the Chet. The next significant time period is 2,000 years. From Adam all the way to Avram, and in that time period, you had all these people, everybody, trying to be Masak and the Bria. Because each one at that time was, had the ability of Tikkun, to they rectify knew, creation. They knew that? Uh, um, yeah, probably knew that, yeah. Because that was the Maseris. That was Because Adam Rishon lived all the way up to the time of Noach. And they did all the time. Time. during that time. The what? Even though they knew that the job was to be Tikkun, they were still doing all the Chet. Yeah, because the, yeah, the Yates of Sure. Yeah. They chose, obviously. Was why would they be punished? But in any case, so you had the second Kufa, or the third actually, looking at from the beginning, where everybody's trying to be, well, they, they were supposed to bring a Tikkun to the Bria for 2,000 years, and that failed. First it failed by Noach, and then of course it failed by the Yedua Flogo. That was the last last. And then the whole union of Tikkun was given over to the Jews. So that's what they had. And that went on until today, which is almost 4,000 years. <coughs> Avram Avinu was 52 years old when the world turned 2000. And we are almost 5,774. So we are, you know, 3,774 years after that. And we are still trying to do the Tikkun. However, we are coming near the end, obviously, and so on. You know. Hanoich was the only one in that door who was able to accomplish his task? Yeah. Well, no, no there, were, there probably were others, but... Um, Hanoi was obviously the greatest of them, and therefore he is... Uh, that he, was take, he was taken... Yeah, because he was weak. Obviously, the Russian felt he's going to fall. <coughs> he named him, means he took him before he could be... Before he accomplished this thing. Yeah, yeah. And Hanoi, they say, was turned into a malach. Matat, anyway. Um, which is uh, one of the highest of the malachim. So. In any case, so you have 4, 000, almost 4,000 years of... It's called the endeavor of Tikkun. <coughs> and that's what we've been doing. Whether it's Mitzvahs or Tshuva or Yisurim, the Jewish people, Klai Yisrael, and anybody who joined them, the Gerim and so on, have been fundamentally trying to do the Tikkun. So we are really at a, a stage which is called the... Um, it's really the last stage. It's the last stage of, of where... Um, you know, it's like the best way to characterize it is if you if you go to a play, a play has different acts and each act has different scenes. So the last scene of the third act, basically, is two acts or three acts. The last scene of the third act is when all the characters come together, and that's the climax of the play. You know, everything you know. The play has been developed in characters. Tying up the it's been developed, yeah, tie, well, it's Everything been, comes together. Yeah, developing the plot, plot, the characters, you name it, right? Mm -hmm. And in the last act, act three, let's say, scene three, is the coming together of everything. Okay? And that is called the, that's the... Uh, grand finale? Yeah, it's the grand finale, yeah, because that's the climax. Everything is done just to bring it all together. And... Um, um, so that's called the redemption. Resolution? Well, it, 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 it's the climax of the, of the play, yeah. And that's called, let's say, the, um, the redemption, the time of redemption. But that itself is divided into three kufas. It's three sub. So that itself. the time of din now, how does that fit into the, uh, this model? Which? I think the, we're in the time of Yeah, day. because it's clean up. It's balancing the books. Because we're almost at the end of the entire process. So what the Bershom has to do is what's called balance the books. He has to now make sure that Klai Israel has done the Tikkun and everything is fixed. 
So how does this become manifest as then? Wait. So it has three different sub phases. So the last phase <coughs> is the redemption phase, where everything has to come together to bring the Geula. And that itself has three sub phases. The first sub phase is called the Ikris of the Meshicha. The second sub phase is called Aschalta de Geula. And the third sub phase is called Yemosa Mashiach. And each one is a distinct phase. All three. Okay. Now, not only it's a whole shear itself, but basically the Ikvus of the Meshicha, which is the first phase of the last stage. Ikvus of the Meshicha fundamentally started in 1840. Ikvus of the Meshicha means that Meshicha is not here, but, you know, they, so, well, you see, it's called the footsteps of the Messiah. What does that mean? If, you, if, if somebody's in front of you, let's say in snow, right? So normally after a certain amount of time, then his footsteps disappear. But if you're very close to him, the mark that he made in the snow is still there, you see. So we are so close to the Mashiach that his marks are visible already. That's how close we are to the Mashiach. So that's equal to the Mashiach these footsteps of the Messiah were so close that you can't actually see his footprints because they haven't dissolved yet. Okay? And that basically started in 1840, you know, according to why and how and so on. Okay? Now, uh, Tav Shin Nun, which is 5,750, was a very pivotal year. <clears throat> Without getting into that, um, that's the real beginning, which is, by the way, 1990. Of the English year, the real acceleration started in 1990, which is Tafshin. What? Internet, what happened? Gulf War. Everything. <laughs> Gulf War, Internet, <laughs> the uh, Germany, uh, uh, communism <laughs> collapsed, Germany was united. I, I'm, I'm not going into the whole year, it's a whole. I'm just giving you dates now, you know, just so you should, I'm giving you orientation. So 1848, Christian Sheikh begins, without going into why, uh, until 1990. Which is Tov Shinun, 5,750. You people familiar with the creation calendar? The creation calendar? No. Oh well. Uh, anyway, 1990 is when it begins. Uh, it, 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 1990 is an explosion of acceleration. And it, <coughs> there's, there's so many things that began then, just beyond belief and so on. Anyway, um, and then you have now. Aschalte de Geula, the beginning of redemption, which is not the same as the Ikris of the Meshicha, the footsteps of the Messiah, like I said. There are many things that have to happen in the footsteps of the Messiah, which is the first stage, in order to create the background for the Meshich to enter. The Aschalte de Geula, the beginning of redemption, is one of two things. It's either the birth of the Meshich ben Yosef, or it's when Meshich ben Yosef knows that he's Meshich ben Yosef which he doesn't know in the beginning. Like Moshe Rabbeinu, did not know who he was until he was 80 years old, you know. But, so we can say that the Yitzchata de Gula probably is when he's born. Mamash, Mashiach from Yosef. That the one who will be the Mashiach is born. That's Yitzchata de Gula. However, there's still a lot that has to happen. There's Mashiach from Yosef, okay, then there's the war of going to Mogoid, and there's a lot of stuff that still has to happen. And then there's the entry of Mashiach ben David and his fight with Goy from the land of Magog. And then once that happens, then you have the Messianic era, the era of Mashiach. And that is what we all pray for, Mashiach ben David, you know, Mashiach ben David, because uh, he's the one who completes the whole thing. And then the world changes. The world changes. Even, even, even Teva changes. There's no more death, no more sickness, you know. Nobody has any shown bias problems anymore. <laughs> anyway. Um, Where is this starting? What? Which year? All the shriggers all of a sudden disappear. Uh, there's no more, there's no bankruptcies. Everything is unbelievable. Uh, just everything, everything is right. You know, there's no problem with Panosso. And then that coup for the Jews will be... Everything. <laughs> Disney World. Disney World, yeah. Well, I don't know, is it Mickey Mouse or is it uh, anyway? 
Um, so that that is a tikufa that we've been looking forward to. That is a tikufa that we've been looking forward to, which is called the Moshe Mashiach, and then from the Moshe Mashiach, the world ends in the year six thousand, which is the English year twenty two forty. The English year twenty two forty is the year six thousand, and the Gemara says that this world will be six thousand. That's the tikufa. Shisa al fishnin hevu alma. It will be for 6,000 years, which is obviously comparable to the six days of creation. Then the world ends, finished, and it's over, okay? But remember, the Moist HaMashiach, or rather the second phase, which is Ashal to the ruler, which is Mashiach and Yosef, is a time, okay, that a Mashiach, he's really here, Mashiach and Yosef. Then you have a lot of stuff going on in that time, and nature or natural law still is, still is operative. But by Mashiach ben David, when he finally does his thing, and then you have the Messianic era, the real Messianic era, which is the ultimate Gula, that is the Gula, and so on, then the natural law doesn't operate the way it did. Obviously, there's no death, no sickness, no wars, no killing, and the Jews will be supreme at that time, and everybody has Panossa, and everybody's a Novi. Yeah, we're all Novian. You just sit down and close your eyes, and all of a sudden you have a divorce. That's how simple it is for any Jew to have that at that time. It will be a time that we cannot even massing. That time, the Moshe Mashiach, by David, not by Yosef. This is all before 6,000. This is all before 6,000. Less than 25 years away. What? Less than 25 years away. Yeah, that, uh, the 20, year 2000. It's because there's a Zoya. I, I said that. Because the Zoya says that by year 2030, Tchis Mason begins, and Tchis Mason begins after Mashiach and David arrives. So what are we now, 2014? We're about to enter 2014. So we got 16 years to go. Uh-oh. That's the maximum? Well, you could that Zoya. Earlier, right? What? Like it could come earlier, right? By Akri Shana? Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying... That's the latest? That's the late. The, according to that Zoya, the, uh, Brian Mahemda, <laughs> he's going to come 2000 or, you know, whatever. By 2030, you're going to have the Sheikh and Dovid, which means that the whole Kufa Ben Yosef... Just going to say, don't go longer, that's only, only a couple, like, a, less than an hour or something? Whatever, whatever. And the, I, I once told you what's going to happen in that 16 years, if that's what it's going to be, right? Which is beyond belief, right? So he's born already, he's alive. Well, it would seem so, yeah. From that, from this perspective, it would seem that he's born. Yeah. Well, the question, does he know who he is or not? What? While this goes on on Earth, where there's no death, there's still Olam Haba? Olam Haba doesn't exist yet. We have to make Olam Haba from this world. We transform this world into Olam Haba. You see? By 6,000. What? By 6,000. Why 6,000? By 6,000. We have, have to, we have to create Olam Haba. By no, 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 no. When Mashiach Ben Dovid has arrived, then the world has reached its Tikkun. Except it will not change into Ilam Habo. So now it's such a change. Because now, process. because what we're looking at now is the. Imam Mashiach is a Tkufa of Ilam Hazer. In other words, it's a Tkufa, a time period of the, a perfect Ilam Hazer. That's what it is. So why do we need that? Why can't we just poof? And uh, Mashiach Ben Dabi comes and he brings Ilam Habo. Why can't. I mean, just say, well, first of all, Ilam Habo has to. It we has have to, to re transform. We have no, to re transform. What's the function yeah. of the Messianic era? What, what, the, what the Messianic era is really, you know, it's, it's, it's where the bunch of, you know, it, it's where Oedem Hazer becomes the greatest level that it, that it can become. It's like the bunch wants to show, you know, you know, the bunch can make an Oedem Habo and, you know, and all of a sudden spiritual. But what the bunch <coughs> demonstrates by changing Oedem Hazer is that Oedem Hazer itself could have been an unbelievable place. Oh, yeah, that yeah. in itself has an incredible potential of being almost completely ruchnius. Even on Yimhazer. You know, it's not that we think, we think, well, you know, uh, you know it's like, um, well, on Yimhazer is tumor, right? Defilement, pollution, right? And the only way you can get away from this is you need on Yimhazer. No. What the Barsham does and <coughs> demonstrates is that on Yimhazer itself has an unbelievable capacity for Ruchnius. And 
it's called, it's, and that utopia is the Yemosa Mashiach. It's the messianic era. Oh, what does Abish need? Does he have to score oh, points against us? No, no, it's not that he needs it. It's, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, remember in Tzrayim, the Bonshim says, this week's Pasha for Ero, you know? You know, I'm, I'm going to really do a job on Par and Azuma. Why? Because I, I want to show them, Kani Hashem, I'm God. You know, in other words, the whole, a, a, a great deal of what happened in Mitzrayim was to demonstrate to the most, the greatest nation on earth at that time, which was Egypt, they need to understand a certain lesson. You know, if you think about it, what's the whole point? The Bolshevik could have sent a plague. There are many plagues in history. The Black Plague, you know, in the 13, 12, 14, 12, 13 and 14th century. He could have wiped out all Egypt. What are you playing games with these guys for? Just kill them all. You know, make them all sick or whatever. I mean, you know, think about that. And then they're all, either they're all dead or dying. I mean, if, if you, you know what happened in the Middle Ages with the Black Death, it was just beyond belief. Whole cities were dying. You know, if you ever, the, the literature on this kind of play, what was going on, you know, you know, everybody was catching it. One third of mankind died, of Europe died. 56 million people died in the Black Death, which was caused by a bacteria, the bubonic plague. Rats carried them. But they had no concept of, of, uh, of what do you call it? Uh, who? Pathogens. Yeah, well, so it's a bacteria. But they don't have a, I don't think they have a cure for that. But it, it's carried by rats, and they were incredibly unsanitary. You know, they never took baths. They never washed their hands. But the Jews were okay because Ashiyotza, you know, they, mikvah, Ashiyotza, man, you know, you know if, if you think, how many times do you wash your hands every day if you go out of the bathroom? So the Jews didn't get it. So then they blamed the Jews that the Jews are poisoning the wells. I get that whole history. But it was beyond belief. People were dying all over. So the bunch of them could have done the same thing to Egypt. And you have a whole bunch of basket cases. And that's the end of it, you know. And therefore there's no more. I mean, they're going to stop the Jews. And then the Jews go right and walk right out. You see what I'm saying? But clearly there was a message. You know? There's, the Muslim wanted to send a message to Egypt. Well, what, yeah, well, yeah, well, whatever, but... Uh, you know, the message, what, if look, I want to tell you something. The Egyptian, the story of Egypt, Mitzrayim, isn't just about the redemption of the Jew to get out. It's far more than that. It is an instruction, a message, that the Muslim wanted to leave the Egyptians and all mankind. You know, so and, and therefore, point. in this way, wait, 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 <clears throat> and therefore, Ani Hashem is the message, and that's why it had to go through all the markets and so on and so forth. Basically, you know, the same thing. We think Olam Haza is a terrible place. It is devoid of all ruchnias. It's only Toma. That's a you know, you know, materialism itself is terrible. All that, but the truth is. What the Russian wanted us is to change, not just change Oilam Hazeh into Oilam Habo, but to change Oilam Hazeh at the lowest level into Oilam Hazeh at a higher level. It's really what he wants in the end. You know, so the Tikkun is not just a Ruchni's Tikkun. It's a Ruchni's within Geshem itself. So therefore, Yemoisam Sheikh is that. It's where the Jews change Oilam Hazeh at the lowest level into the greatest level of Gashmi's ever seen. You see, because the Ruchni's in the Ruchnis in in, in, uh, in Yemoisa Mashiach is beyond compare. We cannot, when it says, Kimonorot Deir Sashem, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God, right? We, we cannot comprehend what a physical place is going to look like when it's perfect. You see, and that's a very important idea that the Bosh wants to give. That he wants to, you know, because Olam Haba would mean, well, then all the Goyim are gone. You know, but if there's a perfect, if what's called utopia, you know, the messianic era, if there's a perfect Olam Hazer, you know, then everybody gets it. The, all the Goyim, you know, you call based field, you call Amen, everybody will see what the physical world was, you see. And you don't have to run away to a spiritual place to live in an incredible Ruchniz de Gemachim. So what it really is, is the perfection of Olam Hazer, before you even get to Ilm Habo. And there's that void there? That's a very important concept, the perfection. What the Russian wants is, he wants to make Ilm Hazer the <coughs> greatest Ilm Hazer of all time. And that's Himash Mashiach. Where Ilm Hazer, a physical world, is saturated with Ruchnias. And at that time, everybody lives to see it. And all the Goyim, the Jews, all the Rishoyim, and they look and say, wow, this is what Ilm Hazer could have been. 
No, no, no more zman avoid. It's all gone. Will Elam Abba be enhanced by that era? No, no. Because Elam Abba, Elam Abba is a different reality. So what's the point? Then? The it's a, I'm, but, I'm, I'm, but I'm trying to give what the point is. What was the point that the Bosham delayed the Yitzhia of Mitzrayim for one year? Why? Be, because we should, we should have a Muna throughout our God. No, he didn't have a Muna. Excuse well, me. We should all know about that. And, and Martin Torah would Excuse me. No, 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 no. Martin Torah wouldn't have been a Muna? Come on. It's the greatest Gita the Bosham ever know. In other words, the Egyptians will die. Here's what the scenario could have been. All the Egyptians will die, or they get sick, or whatever, right? And they're all dying in the streets and all that. And the Jews just pick themselves, and they don't, of course. They walk out and finish. Then they go to Har Sinai, and there it is. The real moon of Christ was Mount Terra. You know what I'm saying? Even though we have Vamini Bashem and Moshe Avdoi, like Kriya Samson. So he could have done that also. He had, had to enhance that way to somehow. It's a good question you're asking. But no, no, what, what I'm trying, our, so what I'm trying to say is Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is far more than the redemption of the Jews from slavery. Much more than that. And the Bosham says it. You doubt them, and he will know that I am the Lord, the Bosham, God, the care of our the care of our hearts. It has a the uh, Yitzhiya's mind has multiple um uh, multifacets, yeah. It's multifaceted. It has many things that the Bosham wants to accomplish, and so on. Everything, you know. But fundamentally this is very important that the world has to know I am God. There is a God, and this is what I, that I'm the master of the physical world, and so on. Anyway, so, Oilam Hazeh, as the Imosa Mashiach, is in many ways the same message. That what the Bansha wanted is a perfect Oilam Hazeh. You don't have to go to Oilam Haba. Oilam Hazeh is incredible. You see, <coughs> and the world will know, the entire world at that time will live and will see. This demonstration. Of What's the point of the third base of Mikdash? You know, it's interesting. It's I want to tell one interesting idea. It's getting late. I want this idea. You know, historians estimate how many people were there on the planet uh, at the time of the Romans. What was the population of the Earth at the time of the Romans? Anybody know? No. Oh, the first base of English? No, no, no. Second, second, second. Time of the Romans. I let's say two thousand years ago. Actually, it's more. No, have what? A billion. One billion. No. How many people there now? Most people don't realize this. How many people there now? Where? No. Seven. There's over seven billion people. So my question is, and remember, Roman period already is like, well, at least, uh, was it, uh, four? The Roman period was 3,000 years after the creation of the world. How many people were there on the planet? So historians estimate, I mean, there was no census bureau, obviously, you know. But historians estimate there were approximately, I think, if I remember correctly, about 200 million people. Why? That's it. That's it. We think, you know, today, 7 billion people. The time of the Romans, there was only 200 million people. That's all, 225, I think the number is. That's what they estimate based on. What? And how many were in China? <laughs> I'm saying that. Well, China always had over a billion. I mean, you just couldn't get rid of the Chinese. No, no. Well, Anyway, but so the, 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 so the question is this: When did the world first reach one billion people? Well, 1840. They figured out medicine. Yeah, about 1840, 1850. So look how long it took to reach one billion people. You know what I'm saying? And now, from let's say 1850, let's say right, 1850 till what? So 2012, it grew by six billion people because of the progression. It's it's a, it's a, it's not even arithmetic, really. It's a geometric progression. It's almost exponential. Question is why? Why do we have now over seven billion people, and then 2,000 years ago, 2,300 years or whatever, you only have about 200 million people. Balancing the books. Who? Balancing the books. No. You're what I want to bring billion, out is this. What? No, no, that's not what my point is. This. No, my point is this. If you figure it out, I think, you know, if you add up, okay, all the people over all the years that lived, right? Because people live, they die, live, die, and so on. If you accumulative all the generations of mankind, it will be about seven, eight billion people. So what does that mean? He's bringing everybody back. He's bringing everybody back. It means instead of dispersing or distributing 
Nishomas over thousands of years, so there's 200 million, 300 million, 400 million, right? What happens if you bring all of them back in one shot? Act 3. Who? Act 3. Act 3, exactly. That's the, so therefore, why is he doing that? Because of the grand finale. That's why. Because he wants everybody to look at Oilam Hazer in its perfection, you see. And what Ruchnis could have been Oilam Hazer, and they're all going to be here. It's like he's increasing the audience of the play. <laughs> you see, that's really what, when you realize that's really what's happening. Instead of everybody being distributed over thousands, four, five thousand years, right? He's going to bring them all back in one shot. All the Gagulim, all the Goyim, you name it. And those are all the billions of people. And we now have seven billion. We don't, you know, let's say it goes for another billion or whatever. But at a certain point, when the Mashiach arrives, they're all here and they're all looking. Why? Ani Hashem. Let me show you who really was behind everything, who did the redemption, everything. You know, who Kali who really is, and everybody's going to be in the audience. The show, be, the show begins in 16 years, basically. Yeah, well, that show, yeah. Zoya, yeah. Zoya, right? that, the Contra at Zoya, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. We're going to go land for Zoya, right? Yes, sir. What? If you were young, you should be The average person will live 50 years. Well, then? Yeah. The average person lives at 30. He was dead by 30. 30. So, so he's much more than 6 billion. You're 200 million. Look, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to give a certain concept that if you, that's all. I mean, we don't really know the end. The Russian knows the number. But if you think about it, what we're, we're, we're witnessing is the accumulation, really, of everybody ever lived in one shot, in one generation. Well, why? Question is why. And the answer to that is because he wants the total population of the planet <coughs> as an audience for the grand entrance of the Mashiach, which is really the grand entrance of the Shekhinah. And they're all going to witness. And that's what it means. You call the Cholo Amen, based filah. You the Cholo Amen. So does the Cholo Amen means now, or what means everybody who ever lived? And so on, you know, see? So therefore, that, that's, in many ways, that's the purpose of a Messianic era. Is this concept brought, up, brought down? Somewhere that everybody will be back by the time Mashiach comes, that all the Gilgulim, that everybody will be back. I have never seen the concept brought down. It's my own finish. I've never seen it. But I'm just surmising. It makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. think about it, you know. What's, what's the purpose of the, ba- the Baish Zishim? Because you said that vote is, is done because we've done Yeah, it. wait, wait, wait. I want to finish this. Huh? Mm-hmm. We can't stop at the This is the last year. I mean, it's like, I mean, for this... Grand finale. Grand, this grand finale. It's not the grand finale, it's a... It's a finale. Yeah. How does the world transform in the scene of holding lights? How? Wait, 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 wait. So, we now have the three sub-phases of the last phase, Act 3, Scene 3, which is the Messianic, uh, uh, the redemption uh, process and so on and so forth. Anyway, so, um, and then you have, of course, Mishik and Yosef, Mishik and Dovid, and uh, this is it. So, you know, the, uh, like I said, what will, will happen in the Messianic era, forget about little Mahabo, we cannot comprehend. We cannot comprehend. <clears throat> I think I once told you the way there's a message that you see that we're about to see something beyond comprehension. You know, so it says that the, the, the Medrash Rabbo at the end of Kohelas, it's an incredible Medrash, it says that the, the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, well, what's the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Sh- Bavli, Yishami, Shulchanor, all the Rishonim, all the Achroinim, all the Tshuvas from, right, Shedis and Tshuvas from, all the Mutsas from, all the Ashkof, all the Kabbalah, you name it, right? It's massive. You walk into any big bookstore, you know, hundreds of thousands of books that were printed over the years, manuscripts and so on, beyond belief, right? So the Medrash says that the Tiras Moshe Rabbeinu, which is what everything I just said, is Hevel, Compared to the Torah of the Mashiach. Mashiach. What does Hevel mean? Luft, air. That the Torah, the whole Torah we have today is not even substance compared to what will be revealed in the Mashiach's era. So you think that's beyond belief. I thought it was the same. No, no, it's Hevel. It's not even, it's not even a mamash. That's what Hevel is, Luft. And then the Medrash continues and says, so we, obviously we're talking about Kimor Deo, Molo Orids Deo. Literally, so the earth will be saturated, right, with the knowledge of the Rabbanu Shalom. 
And that knowledge is almost infinitely more than what we have now. And this is Olam Hazer. And then the Medrash continues and says that the Torah of Mashiach is Hevel compared to the Torah of Olam Haba. Now, can I ask you, like, can you have a comprehension of this? No. So, and we're talking about a physical time. We're talking about a tkuf in Olam Hazer, you know, with, where you have nations and you have people, Jews, Everybody's walking around with suits and, you know, you know whatever. We're not talking about a, a, another, another uh, dimension. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, what we're about to do is beyond belief, you know. And I, 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 I like to just give this example, you know. It says that the Iqbis of the Mashiach, actually the whole, the, uh, the whole redemption process, the mess, the Gula process and so on, you know. It says it's called Chevle Leida. Chevle Leida. Birth, uh, the Thanks. birth pangs of the Mashiach. You know? Why is it called Heavenly Leda? So I, I always like to give this motion. Imagine, there's an embryo in the uterus, right? And it's gewaldic. It gets food when it wants. It, it has everything it needs. Peace, security, warm environment. Because in the uterus, it's phenomenal for the infant. Okay? <coughs> then, so it thinks, wow, what a, what a life. And then all of a sudden, after nine months, well, something happens. The body, which is incredible, turns the kid around, puts its head down, right? And the uterus begins to contract. We need to shove this kid out. And all of a sudden, this kid says, it's over. It's suicide. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> it's curtains. I'm about to buy the farm, as they say. Whatever lotion you use, <laughs> this is it. This is the grand finale, right? Why? Because its head is being crushed, right? You know, and thank God the devotion did a chesed where he made the skull three parts. I mean, everybody as a kid knows that, you know, you got to be with the center. You can't press because the bones don't get together. It takes about a year or two to leave, you know. So therefore, all of a sudden, the head is like weird shape, you know, because the kid is being crushed. By the, and the uterus has incredible muscles, you know? And it's pushing this kid out, and the kid is squeezed. It's called the great squeeze. <laughs> now that kid, as far as that kid is concerned, it's over with. Finished, you know? But does that kid know <clears throat> that after all the great squeeze, it's gonna pop out into a world that is so radically different from the world it came from, right? And it's an unbelievable, the kid can't even believe such a, a world of dimension. Lights and, you know, it's like, and people, it's like I thought I was the only one around, you know. Uh, and, and so so forth. In other words, when you compare the existence of the child, the embryo, in the, in the, in the uterus, and compared to existence outside, it's like, it, it's, not, you can't, it's not the same thing. It's, it's, it's like, whatever, beyond comprehension. The kid cannot conceive of a world beyond the uterus. We, where are we in this analogy that I've just given you, which is called the Great Squeeze? You know, or the, you know, the it, it was called like the kid had a utopian life, right? It was warm. The kid ate whenever it wanted. It slept like it was a machaya, as they say, you know. And all of a sudden, it went through this process of terrible anxiety and anguish. But the ultimate of that is to come into a different universe, okay, which the kid could never conceive. Where are we? This concept of Iqbis the Mishicho, and then you have Aschalta the Gula, then you have the Gula itself, is the great squeeze. We are being shoved down. And let me tell you something. When does a kid really feel the, the, the death? Right at the end. Because right when its head is about to crown, right? It's the greatest squeeze of all, right? Because in, in, in back there, is, the universe itself is more room. But as you go down this incredibly small canal, and the squeeze, it's, it gets worse. And when is the worst? Right before it comes out. That's why it's called Chevre Mashiach. Because we are really the same thing. We are entering, and we have been in already. We are headed down into the great squeeze. And that's why we see such enormous amount of acceleration. We see the Holocaust. We see the, the, the persecution, the pogroms, Holocaust. We see the terrible, uh, what do you call it, the expulsions. The, the, the terrible, the, what Edom does to us, Esau. 
and what Yishmuel does to us, the terrible destruction and so on, the killings and the threats and so on and so forth, this is all the great squeeze. And when finally it's over, and all of a sudden you come out, right, you are going to see Yimoyz HaMashiach, or rather, you can see Yimoyz HaMashiach, which is a, a kufa, a, a time period that we cannot comprehend. That's where we're at. So the last three subphases is the beginning of the entry to be born. And we are getting closer and closer to the end. That's why you see the Holocaust, you see such terrible things happening, you know, that all the nations are against Klai Israel. And now even Iran now can make their bombs and so on. I mean, it's like wherever you look, there's threats and there's danger, you see, because that's the great squeeze that's happening now. And that's why it's called Hevel and and so on. But remember, the Nechama is that when this is over, we will enter a universe that is so radically different than the world we know that nobody could imagine what in the world is going on. Yeah, another mushroom is like, in, the first thing, it, it take a guy from New Guinea. <coughs> New Guinea is one of the most primitive places on earth, you know, and they never saw a white man until 1953. It's the first time they saw a white man, you know. Some guy came out of the sky or playing, you know. To, you know, if you imagine you take this guy, you know, or even better yet, you know, you take, imagine taking a guy who lived 800 years ago, you know. And you take him, put him in a time machine, right? And you put him in 2013, he pops in 2013, in the middle of Fifth Avenue. <laughs> he died, he would drop dead. He could never assimilate. I mean, like, what, 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 you know, what is this? You know, people walking around, they, 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 it's some kind of a metal thing, you know, and they're driving, you know. Yeah. And then there's guys walking around talking to themselves. You know, and then there's the guys fooling around with a little gadget. There, you know. he, he couldn't, the, in skyscrapers, and this guy comes out of a mud hut, and so, you know. <laughs> he could not assimilate this. He would die. I mean, he would be, he'd be shot, you know. Uh, he'd have to go straight to a psychiatric ward. You know, it's the same thing. The relationship between him and the world that we have now, modern civilization, right, is the same shock as the relationship between what we have now and the Muslim Shia. We will be shocked, mama shocked, and uh, and, and this is not this is not ruchnis. I mean, this is not oilim hapo. This is a shuffle, right? This is oilim shuffle. I mean, could you believe that an oilim shuffle will look like this? No. That's what the Bosh wants to say. Sure. You know? Of course he could have knocked everybody out and here's Oil Mahab and that's the end of it and finished. You know? But no. Because the message he wants to deliver is I am God in Oil Hazer. Not just God in Oil Habo. Because remember, we believe that Bosh is Oil Habo, which means that he's Ruchni. That really this is not this world is devoid of Ruchnias. Right? And you want to get away from Geshem materialism, you need to go to Oil Habo. Wrong. Oilam Haza itself can achieve the greatest ruchnius unimaginable. You see. And that's really what we try to do, and that's what the Jews did. And so on. And therefore, God is not only the God of the future, He is the God of the past and the present. He is the God of Oilam Haza, not just the God of Oilam Haba. And that's the mistake that everybody made. Yeah, Allah said love her, you know? And so on. No. Uh, and, and that's what he's going to demonstrate. That you don't need an Oilam Habo, really, to be on the greatest level of existence. He's going to give you Oilam Hazer as the greatest level of existence. And then, when you get finished with that, then you're really going to get stunned with Oilam Habo. Because Oilam Oilam Hazer to Yomas Mashiach is darkness. Yomas Mashiach to Oilam Habo is utter black. Imagine what awaits uh, people and so on. So this basically, although there's more I wanted to say, but anyway, uh, is, is basically the different kufas of what, what's going to happen. And we're very close. We are very close uh, to this whole kufa happening and so on. So where are we picking up, picking up from when you come back in the session? <laughs> It'd be great if it was the Muslim Shia, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But what is it? Well, we'll have to come back. We'll be in trance. Well, I'm going to call that Kufus. Believe it or not, it's Paragimel. Uh, uh, 
section given and so on, you know. So I'll just read them, you know. Uh, but um, in, in any case, so hopefully you have a much greater handle on a lot of different inyonim that Ramchal has spoken about, you know. I think you have a much better handle uh, and, and so on. Um, uh, in any case, it's certainly something to look forward to, and uh, certainly we hope it'll be soon, you know. But it, it will be soon, because we're no longer looking at thousands of years to the Mashiach. You're looking at Mamash a, couple, a year, two years, three years, um, until Mamash until Mamash happens and so on. Uh, and then when it does, then it'll be incredible. All the rights will have been wronged, wronged. All the wrongs will have been right, right. And um, a lot of people will realize the mistakes that they have made, and so on and so forth. And uh, the Jews will be the greatest nation on earth. Imagine being a celebrity. Imagine people running after you for your autograph. <laughs> no. Right now they're running after you to kill you. <laughs> when Mashiach comes, they're going to be running after you for your autograph. Because how many Jews really are there and so on, you know? There's billions of going and so on. And uh, the Jews will be supreme, the greatest nation on earth. For all time. And that's the end of the, that's the, end of the Golos. And the... Uh, and the uh, and that will be a t- time of un- <coughs> unparalleled uh, growth in Ruchmias. Because that's really what it's all about. When Mashiach comes, you will have unparalleled access to incredible growth. Because I, I once said, the essence of Golos, which people make a mistake, we think Golos is because we're exiled from a place. No. Golos is where you're exiled from yourself. That you cannot be who you can be. You know, it's like the army. I think the, uh, the motto is, be what you can be. Golos is where you cannot be what you can be. We have so many obstacles and impediments that we can't. And the Golos will be over, not only because there's no persecutions that would be in its throat. <coughs> the Golos will really be over because then you can grow to the full length of your potential. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And that the model of the base of Middash reflects the, the real in its Tikkun form. Because the base of Middash always reflects the Matsum of Tikkun. Saying would come earlier, then would have lasted six thousand. Yeah, would have lasted six thousand. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the what's the moral of the story? Moral story is hang in. Do read the mitzvahs. Look forward. Do the right thing to chaper eyes. Chaper eyes. I'll see you.